7 visa program um, is really a program that allows labour market flexibility. Um, and I've got to say, it's no surprise that it's the union movement uh, that are most against labour market flexibility, and it's the union movement who are the biggest voices against 457 visas. But Aaron, just have a look at this. We found this on Gumtree today. This is an ad for a job that's for a, uh, a full-time cook, and it offers the job only to people who have 457 visas. Now, how are we meant to understand that as anything but a rort that stops locals applying for that job? Look, I think the best people to police uh, 457s and the need for 457 visas are the businesses themselves. I know of a local restaurant uh, in regional Victoria that can't find local chefs and they've had to employ two people, two chefs, on 457 visas. Now, if they weren't able to do that, uh, that'd close down the restaurant and that'd cost the job of right. 20 locals. And good for them, and I'm glad that they can access the 457, but it doesn't actually answer the question because there you have an example of someone who is not interested in a local worker. They're saying we only want foreign workers probably because they can pay them less. Uh, look, that, that's incorrect. Um, and it's incorrect because foreign workers are subject to the same uh, labour regulations as uh, a local worker. Uh, the Fair Work Act will still apply. But there are cases now where workers have been underpaid. There's one, you know, $100,000 underpaid over, over three years. So clearly not all businesses are doing the right thing and, and they're not being able to police themselves well. Uh, I think that there are adequate measures in place um, for those companies um, to be um, you know, reprimanded uh, and, and held to account. What's being debated is whether the need is there for the 457 visas, and I think the proof's in the pudding. If uh, businesses are after people, uh, foreign workers, for jobs, um, that's evidence of the need existing. All right, Alan, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks so much for your time tonight. Great to be with you. When Queensland flooded in 2011, it was the state's most devastating natural disaster. 35 people lost their lives, among them the incredibly brave little boy, Jordan Rice. Entire towns have been slammed by a fist of angry water. This is ground zero. Across Queensland, it was wide-scale devastation, as town after town was swamped by unprecedented flooding. 2011 was meant to be a good year. As we weep for what we have lost, and as we grieve for family and friends, I want us to remember who we are. We are Queenslanders. January 10th, an inland tsunami raged through Toowoomba and the Lockyer Valley. 25 people died in that region alone. That tsunami that uh, went through that area may well be replaced by a tsunami of grief. John Tyson's partner Donna and two young sons Jordan and Blake were caught up in the chaos that day, taking refuge on the roof of their car. When help finally arrived, 13-year-old Jordan told the rescuer, take my brother first. They would be his last words. Moments later, he and his mum Donna were swept to their deaths. All I can do is thank you both. Tell anyone to listen just how much I love you both. Godspeed, my little angels. Jordan was hailed a hero. The legend of Jordan's amazing courage will go on. Jordan Rice. It should be to this generation what Simpson and his donkey was to earlier ones. At the time, then opposition leader Tony Abbott also said he should receive our highest bravery award, the Cross of Valour. Three years on and Jordan's family is still waiting for that honour. John started a petition online just five days ago. More than 115,000 people have already signed it. It's very humbling, tell you the truth. You read a lot of the comments and some of the beautiful things people say, and you know, you go from proud to sad, just a mixed bag, really. Thousands of acts of unsung heroism played out across Queensland in its darkest hour. But Jordan Rice became a symbol, not just of the tragedy, but of the power of courage and love. Oh, what a brave little boy. Every time I hear that story, it just brings me to tears. It's just horrible, horrible. And to think three years on, still mm. no award. And to do that at 13, was oh, it? 13. Yeah. Mm. Oh, wow. Well, Warren McElain was one of the Good Samaritans, along with another local man, Chris, who rescued Blake, and he joins us now. Warren, as we just said there, going back to that, every time we hear that story, it, you know, it just brings us to tears. It's absolutely devastating. Can you talk us through what Jordan did during that moment when he was being rescued, to, to, to you know, what he did when you were trying to make sure that Blake was safe? Well, um, I, was on the, uh, I was on the rope, and Chris was beside the car, and 
um, Chris had a hold of Jordan. Jordan yelled to Chris and um, then Chris just tried to uh, pull Jordan out of the car but Jordan pushed him away and um, pushed himself to the back of the car and just pushed Blake forward and lifted him up onto um, Chris and, um, and yeah, just let him go first. Like, I, I couldn't understand why he didn't come out and um, it just, um, still to this day, just, um, I'm just bewildered by his actions. I can hear, Warren, in your voice that, you know, it's very hard for you to talk about. I can imagine that, you know, there's not a day goes past that you don't think about what happened that day. Oh, no, there isn't. And that, so it just, um, some things stay with us always. I suppose um, uh, it's something I'll, I'll just never ever shake, but, um, but we move forward, we focus on positive things. And what would it mean, what would this honour for Jordan mean for you know, Blake and, and, and John and the rest of the family? Mate, um, um, Blake, John, Chris, Kyle, and that um, Donna and Jordan will always be heroes to them. Jordan's actions on the day um, just um, were incredible. To put, to put his brother first above everything else was probably the most um, selfless act I've ever seen. And Warren, you've, you've in fact stayed in touch with Blake and you share this wonderful bond yep. now. Yeah, well we, um, we, we run amok, me and, uh, me and Blake, so we um, uh, we've been away on a few holidays together and do a, do a bit of fishing and uh, we, um, we get around and run a bit of a muck and the wife yells and screams at us but <laughs> we, have a, um, we have a great time and it's just great to be able to have that relationship with the family. Well it's hard to know what to say Warren other than you and Jordan you were both heroes and you know what you did that day was incredible and yeah let's hope that you know you can both be honoured appropriately. Thanks so much for your time tonight. Excellent, thanks very much for your time guys. Yeah. And I, a great man there too. Absolutely, and I hope they are honoured appropriately. It's been three years and so far nothing. But the Prime Minister did give us a statement today, the Prime Minister's office, uh, saying that he has approached the Governor-General to ask for his support in ensuring proper consideration is given to his nomination. Now, I don't know if whether you think that's enough or perhaps mm. he could have been more emphatic, but at least I suppose the ball's rolling in some way. Yeah, and I, don't th I don't think it needs just consideration. I think it, this is, it, needs to it needs to happen and it can't just be a hollow gesture. So I think we should all get behind the petition and uh, you can head to our website and mm. there'll be the petition there so you can join it. We're going to take a break now. We'll be back with you in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to the project. Some more news now. Interior Pierce, who suffered life threatening burns during an ultra marathon in WA in 2011, has reached a settlement with race organisers reportedly worth $10 million. The 26 year old suffered burns to more than 60% of her body after being trapped by a bushfire that tore across the course. A brand war blunder for the Socceroos ahead of the World Cup in Brazil. They'll miss out on valuable practice time with the official Adidas match balls because of the team's Nike sponsorship. Captain Mirla Yedinak's unimpressed commercial deals have taken priority over team preparation. A man that every company would love to have a commercial deal with but simply cannot afford is HG Nelson. HG, do they really need to practice with this special ball before the World Cup? They certainly do, Waleed. We're talking about the brazooka. The brazooka that's going to be the ball used in the World Cup getting underway in just over a fortnight's time. Look, we saw the disaster of the current ball, and I can't mention names here due to sponsorship agreements between the Australian uh, Soccer Federation or the FFA and, of course, the World Cup. But at the moment, we're using a turd. Let's not beat around the bush. We're playing with a turd over there. We're not getting any go forward when you put the boot into it. It just comes sticks to the shoe. It's just terrible. We saw the match last Monday night, South Africa won, Australia won, we are using the turd, but this new brazooka that we've got to get our hands on is part of our World Cup plan to beat Spain, to beat Netherlands, to beat Chile and go on to the group of eight, 16 and then go on to the group of eight. If we get to the final, the brazooka is an essential part of Australia winning this World Cup and we're denied, we're nobbled at every turn, we're going to be done before we even get started unless we can get our hands on the brazooka. <laughs> so hopefully we have better luck uh, in Brazil than we have in France at the moment. Uh, Sam Stozer, the only Aussie left. Can she go all the way? 
She can, of course she can, uh, plead a tremendous observation there. But I'm not writing this whole French Open chilled off at Roland Garros. Oh no, I thought we did terrifically well. Uh, the lad who rolled in the clay I thought was a terrific addition to what you can do after you win. I thought Tomic was on fire in his press conference. He got the red jumper on or the uh, rain jacket on in the maroon, zipped it up in case any of the yeah. reporters were about to hurl stuff in his direction. Uh, and of course we've got Sam Stozer still there. What happened a little late and well that's a story people will have to go and check on or Google it up and look at the scores. It was a tremendous French Open and I see it as a building block to tackle Wimbledon. That's how I've always seen the French Open and people always ask me who Roland Garros was as I travel the world. He was a bloke who invented the idea that a bullet could pass through a propeller. Of course he was a great tennis player as well. Enjoy your weekend at Sport HG. Thanks for speaking to us. Delighted. Time now to see what else is making news around the globe. A blow for the Ukrainian government as it tries to crush the pro-Russian rebellion in the country's east. Fourteen of its soldiers, including a general, were killed when their helicopter was shot down outside Slovians. It's one of the heaviest losses separatists have inflicted on the army in two months of fighting. A tragedy for two mothers in South Africa who've discovered their daughters were mistakenly switched at birth four years ago. The case is now before the courts because one woman wants to reclaim her biological child, so the other is refusing to give up the little girl she's raised as her own. And a hair-raising experience for a group of tourists in Chicago. As they took photos from the 103rd floor sky deck of the Willis Tower, they heard and felt the glass floor beneath them cracking. You could see the, the, the glass actually just, like a spider web, immediately just light up, shattered, completely shattered. That is just like the worst possible thing that could ever happen. No, no, no. The worst possible thing is if it breaks and you fall down. That would be far worse. Yeah. Oh. yeah, but they're sightseers. They saw a sight. Good on them. <laughs> have you been one of those things? Well, I have. I've done the Eureka Sky Deck and oh. I struggled and I was holding on to the... If that... Ha that's actually, I'd be traumatised. I was traumatised watching that then. Oh. Speaking of something that's traumatic, how horrible is that situation with the two mums that they found their four-year-olds, one of, you know, that they were switched at birth and one mother wants to give up her little four-year-old to have her biological daughter come back and the other one has said no. Like, that just... And if it doesn't go ahead, that little four-year-old will always know, oh, mum wanted, wanted to, to hand me back. She didn't want to keep me. Yeah. You guys are looking no, at me. I'm, I'm struggling to find something funny to say about that, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pete, it's Friday night, it's Friday night. Come on. <laughs> Well, so I've got, got a Friday night funny for you. Well, let's stay overseas. This uh, London Sky News reporter got a little bit peeved at Big Ben during a, a news cross. See if you can pick the moment when. David Cameron will travel to Brussels later today for a meeting with Europe's leaders that was always scheduled for immediately after the European election.